I'm Dan Rundy. I hold the Schreier Chair here at CSIS. Uh, let me provide a little context for the discussion. I'm going to speak a little longer uh, than I generally would uh, when I moderate an event to set the stage. Um, we're here at a time when the U.S. Congress is debating reauthorization of the Exim Bank, the Export-Import Bank of the United States. If Congress does not reauthorize Exim Bank, it'll close down on July 1. Uh, in a perfect world, Exim Bank would not exist. Uh, traditionally, the Exim Bank has been a vehicle to sell American-made products to countries with limited or no access to capital. The Exim Bank can lend at a risk premium benchmark to commercial rates um, in ways that some banks can't uh, in certain risky circumstances. And as a result, significant percentages of industrial products around the world are financed using export credit agencies such as the Exim Bank. Uh, the Exim Bank does not essentially take any money from the U.S. Congress. Uh, it gets permission to lend up to a certain amount uh, and actually sends hundreds of millions of dollars back uh, in essentially profits each year to the, to the U.S. Treasury. In its 80-year history, Exim Bank has been used to finance the building of the Pan American Highway, had a role in rebuilding Europe after World War II, and helped restart relations with the former Soviet Union after the Cold War. Uh, I want to highlight three reasons that proponents use in favor of authorization. Uh, the first is the hundreds of thousands of jobs directly linked to Exim Bank financing. The second, there are 60 export credit agencies around the world, including in China and all of our OECD uh, partners and competitors. Uh, we should not be in the business, is one of the arguments, that we should unilaterally disarm our export credit agency, the Exim Bank. Um, there's a concept in nuclear weapons uh, uh, policy called uh, nuclear zero, which to seeks to zero out all nuclear weapons. And I don't see nuclear zero for export credit agencies any time in the next 20 years. Um, the other reason, the third reason, is that Exim Bank serves as fuel injection for U.S. engagement with developing countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America who are seeking to participate in globalization. However, if someone wanted to close a government agency, this is one that has a number of features that makes it vulnerable to critiques and attack. Let me mention two that I think are particularly trenchant. Um, first, there is the charge of crony capitalism. More than 70% of the lending portfolio in dollar value are, come from 10 companies. Let's face it, the optics of this are awkward. Uh, many candidates for president have openly opposed the Exim Bank. Candidate Obama in 2008 called Exim Bank crony capitalism, indicating his opposition to the Exim Bank. I'll let the representative from Exim Bank explain the change of heart. Uh, many leading GOP candidates for 2016 including Jeb Bush, have come out against the Exim Bank. It's ironic, as Governor Bush ran a company that once used Exim Bank financing. Uh, one possible presidential candidate who is an exception, I think not the only exception, is Lindsey Graham, who recently said, there is no way in hell I will let Exim Bank expire, in typical Lindsey Graham fashion. Um, second is the charge that also, I think, is vulnerable for the Exim Bank is the issue of transparency. Exim Bank has recently removed data about what loans it accepts and rejects. I think this is a problem and feeds into suspicions about the bank. Exim Bank should fix this. Uh, among supporters, there are two significant changes that are often mentioned um, in terms of changes that they'd like to see, and I think legislation that's in front of the U.S. Congress tries to deal with some of these. Uh, um, the, uh, the first is the issue the, uh, is the percentage of U.S. content. In a world of global supply chains, it is becoming more difficult to piece together manufactured goods that are largely made in the U.S., and therefore, Exim ought to lower the content percentages to qualify for Exim loans. Uh, the response to this critique is that, uh, is that Exim uses content as a proxy for U.S. jobs. Uh, that leads me to the other charge, which I think is at the center of the reauthorization debate on the Hill. Um, and that is the use of Exim credits for coal-related industries. About 18 months ago, the Democratic majority of the Exim Bank voted 3 to 0 to place regulations that effectively stopped financing for coal-related industries. Uh, the Congress has signaled twice that it would like to end these job-killing rules. Most of the authorization fixes in bills in Congress seek to more permanently uh, fix and push back on this policy. If Anxim Bank's focus is U.S. jobs, then imposing these job-killing regulations on coal does not make any sense. Uh, Democratic Senator Joe Manchin recently said that coal will be a part of Exim Bank's future. So I think as you want, listen to this conversation, you understand that this is one of the elephants in the room. 
Uh, enough from me. Uh, Congressman Dole, uh, who's with us, we're very fortunate to have him, is a Republican from Illinois and is one of the 60 co-sponsors of a Republican bill to reauthorize Exum. So without any further ado from me, you have his biography in front of you. Uh, please welcome Congressman Dole. Thank you. Well, thank you. I um, certainly appreciate you taking the time to come today and to talk about uh, XM Bank. And I was delighted to be able to accept the invitation um, from Chairman Hochberg and the XM Bank. And Dan, thank you so much for, for your leadership on this. Um, obviously, there's a lot of interest about XM Bank up on Capitol Hill. Uh, and its charter is set to expire on June 30th. Um, and let me just tell you, from my perspective, we've got a government program here that helps create jobs and brings $1.2 billion into the federal treasury. That, that to me is fantastic. That's exactly the type of program that I think is, is what we're looking for. Very much pro-growth. In the 112th Congress, uh, I actually was one, uh, I sat as the Vice Chair of the International Monetary Policy and Trade Committee and helped uh, lead the reauthorization of the XM Bank. It was certainly a top priority of mine. Uh, and again, you've heard some of the, the arguments as to why reauthorize. Um, I co-sponsored the Export-Import Bank reauthorization back then. Uh, again, a common sense, bipartisan piece of legislation, one that back then passed the House 330 to 93. So that wasn't some bygone era. That was just a few short years ago. Uh, the arguments for the XM Bank have not changed. Uh, in fact, I believe that there is a majority uh, of the House Republicans uh, that did support, obviously, the XM Bank reauthorization, over 60 percent, and the Senate passed it 78 to 20. So that just kind of puts a, some historical framework and reference around what happened before. Uh, as we look um, going forward, we're looking to obviously have a five-year reauthorization. And again, my clear message to each and every one of you is that the support in Congress is there, and it is bipartisan. But that doesn't mean that we can take reauthorization lightly or we can take it for granted. Uh, we all have to work hard to make the case uh, because the critics of the bank have, are very determined and they've been very organized. So in this Congress, obviously, Congressman Fincher uh, has a bill, uh, and certainly one that I have co-sponsored. It's called H.R. 579 uh, that reforms and expands the export import bank. <coughs> and so as a sponsor of this legislation, uh, I, I, for one, want to just take a step back and talk a little bit about why I think this is a good idea. Why is Export-Import Bank important? Why is it necessary? Many of the critics say, you know, it's, it's only 1.6 percent, represents 1.6 percent of the exports in the United States. Well, as a small business owner, someone that understands meeting a budget and a payroll and trying to make sure that we're hiring more people, I think it's absolutely vital that we're trying to give the tools necessary for some of these small businesses to be able to expand their business and to be able to get their products out to 95 percent of the world's consumers who happen to be outside of the United States. The other thing to look at from my perspective, I, I come from a district where we're the third largest manufacturing district in the nation. 54,000 jobs in the 10th district of Illinois rely upon exports. The Export-Import Bank isn't the end-all, be-all. But I can tell you that 86 percent of the loans that it makes in Illinois go to small businesses. That's an important statistic. Some of the critics of the Export Import Bank have still yet to be able to answer me this. If we're interested in trying to create jobs, if we're interested in trying to grow our economy, how does getting rid of the Export Import Bank increase job growth, expand our economy? And if the answer is it doesn't, then we ought to be looking again at how do we make sure that this gets reauthorized. Not that it doesn't get reauthorized with, without some reforms, because some reforms, I think, are certainly going to be necessary. Dan told you that there's currently 60 members that are on this, uh, this bill that Stephen Fincher and, uh, is, is the lead sponsor of, and certainly I am with him. Um, but again, we need to try to expand that. Uh, we need to expand it, and that's why it's important. As we look at economic growth, I, I continue to be committed to advancing policies that advance economic growth. In Illinois, there's 244 businesses that rely upon the Export-Import Bank. 
And let me just share a story of someone that came in and sat down in my office just the other day. He came in and he said, he said, Bob, I run a business. It's actually right down the road in Baltimore. And you know what? I'm producing tractors. And they're a million dollars a piece. And you know what? The bank, my local community bank, doesn't want to finance that. I need the Export-Import Bank. I need the Export-Import Bank because we're going to ship these tractors overseas. And you know what? If it doesn't get reauthorized, I happen to have a plant over in France. And these jobs that are here in Baltimore are going to France. That's just the reality. And so again, we have a very simple decision to make. Do we choose to step up and reauthorize a mechanism that really only impacts a very small fraction of our exports, 1.6%, but it's a critical 1.6%. It actually provides that financing that oftentimes is a little bit more complicated. And it's not that the private sector necessarily is going to rush in, because oftentimes these are transactions that some of these local banks or these mid-sized financial institutions don't want to take, take on that risk. The Export-Import Bank partners partners very well with a lot of the, the financial institutions out there. And I think you'll hear later on the panel, it's about 98% of the loans that the Export-Import Bank makes is actually partnering up with outside private financial institutions. The fact that the United States stands behind the Export-Import Bank is critical. You hear about not wanting to unilaterally disarm ourselves because we want to be globally competitive. I think it's absolutely critical today that we're talking about being globally competitive. How are we preparing ourselves? We hear it not only from an educational perspective, but we need to make sure that our businesses are able to compete and win. And that means trying to level the playing field. And right now we know that our foreign competitors have their export financing arms that are expanding, not contracting. And so I do believe that it's actually imperative for us that we make sure that this gets reauthorized. You heard the story that every time a Boeing plane lands, over 19,000 small businesses land with that plane. That's the kind of story that we need to tell. We need your help up on Capitol Hill. We need your help to tell the stories of the small businesses that Export-Import Bank impacts, the jobs that Export-Import Bank helps create. And so, if Export Bank, Export Import Bank goes away, who wins? I would argue that the small businesses that rely upon that financing certainly don't win. I would argue that the, the employees, the workers at those businesses certainly don't win. But our competitors abroad, I believe, would win. So I believe this is a bipartisan policy solution. And again, I do believe that we've got to work together. This is a pro-growth pro-jobs policy. And again, I go back to where we started at the beginning. Find me a government program that creates jobs and brings $1.2 billion into our federal treasury. There's not many of them. This is one that actually does those things. This is one that we need to make sure that we are stepping up behind, and we need your help to make sure that you tell this story to members of Congress. I am pleased to say that I know that the United States Senate is working on its own reauthorization. Uh, my hope is, is that that bipartisan piece of legislation will be at least introduced in the next day or two. Uh, that's a huge step forward as well. But this is one of those things that as we look at how do we grow our economy, how do we make sure that there are more jobs out there, the Export-Import Bank is part of the solution, it's not part of the problem. And so there is going to be obviously some political finagling going on and people that will argue uh, both sides of this. And I certainly respect those on the other side of the aisle or those that on the other side of this argument. But I do believe ultimately this is about how do we have a long-term reauthorization that businesses can count on that allow us to compete on a level playing field so that United States businesses can grow and win. I thank you so much for being here today. I appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to you. Uh, and again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Congressman. I'm going to ask the panelists to join me up here. Please come on up. Thank you.
the uh, I think you all have the biographies of, of the folks in front of you, uh, but we really have a very interesting panel um, to unpack the issues that um, that are in front of us here um, at, at this time on the Exim Bank reauthorization. Um, it's Scott, it's Scott Schlegel yes. as uh, Chief of Staff to Chairman Hochberg, and then we have uh, we also have Linda Conlon, who's come in from Philadelphia uh, and is the former vice chair of the Exim Bank Board, but works on uh, trade issues in uh, Pennsylvania and New Jersey um, at the, uh, the World Trade Center there, and you, you have her biography and, as well. And then uh, we also have uh, Don Nelson, who's on an advisory board for Exim. He's a small business owner uh, that works with Exim primarily in the Middle East. And then we're very fortunate to have uh, Linda Dempsey who's from the National Association of Manufacturers. Thanks for being all of you with us. I'm going to ask uh, Scott to start. I'm going to ask each of the panelists to talk for five to seven minutes to uh, share their perspective on Exim Bank, and, um, and then we're going to take it from there. We'll open up the discussion. Good. Well, thanks, Dan, and thank you for, uh, to CSIS for holding this important forum today. It is extremely important to uh, hundreds of thousands of individuals around the country who uh, have relied on XM financing over the last uh, 80 years um, that XM Bank be reauthorized. So just a bit of background, XM Bank is the official export credit agency of the United States. Our mission is to support U.S. jobs through exports, and we meet that, have been meeting that mission for more than 80 years now. Uh, the jobs that we have supported uh, are significant. We've had 164,000 jobs estimated that we supported last year through the financing at XM Bank and 1.3 million jobs since 2009. <clears throat> we do this by providing loans, guarantees, and insurance to exporters and foreign purchasers of U.S. goods and services. We finance businesses large and small, and we do this at absolutely no cost to the taxpayers. And actually, we generate a profit, as you heard earlier. Uh, last year, we generated $675 million, uh, and the previous year, we uh, generated more than a billion dollars for the U.S. taxpayers. Now, that's above and beyond all of our operating expenses and all of our loan loss reserves. Uh, we underrate all transactions ourselves, which, we must, uh, was, which must meet strict standards of reasonable assurance of repayment. We're not an aid agency, we're not a development agency, we're a bank, we expect to get paid back. And our, uh, prudent, we're very prudent with the taxpayer dollars. Uh, our loan loss, or our, I'm sorry, our default rate shows that. We've got a default rate of less than two tenths of one percent, which is a, is a very low uh, default rate. XM Bank's congressionally chartered, and among other things, Congress has asked us to look at three different mandates, one being renewables, another being small business, and the third being sub-Saharan Africa. We work hard to meet these mandates. Uh, we have financed our, our fair share of renewables, and last year we financed $198 million to support U.S. exports related to renewable energy sources such as wind and solar. With regard to small business, last year nearly 25 percent of uh, the dollars that we authorized were for small businesses, and nearly 90 percent of the transactions were for small businesses. Of the 3,000, of the more than 3,700 authorizations the bank financed in 2014, more than 3,300 of them were directly for small businesses. And our small business footprint is even larger when you take into consideration the supply chain uh, of all of the larger business exports that we do, and there's a lot of small business that feed into that. With regard to Sub-Saharan Africa, in the past five years, XM Bank has approved more than $6.3 billion in financing for exports to Sub-Saharan Africa, including a record-setting $2.1 billion of authorizations in 2014. A few examples of that Sub-Saharan Africa uh, financing include 300 electric diesel locomotives from GE Transportation in Erie and Grove City, Pennsylvania, to Transnet in South Africa. Uh, Boeing aircraft that we financed to Kenya Airways, and power generation equipment that we uh, financed to Azito Power in Cote d'Ivoire. These three projects alone supported an estimated 8,000 U.S. jobs. So in order to keep supporting U.S. jobs and generating money for the taxpayers, we need to be reauthorized by June 30th. Uh, 
Uh, in the House, there's a bill that uh, you heard from Congressman Dold about that uh, he and, and Representative Fincher are on, along with uh, 57 of their colleagues. It would reauthorize the bank for uh, five years. There's also another bill over in the House that wasn't mentioned. Uh, this is sponsored by Representatives Waters, Hoyer, Moore, and Heck. That bill has 189 co-sponsors on it and would reauthorize the bank for seven years. So when you take the number of co-sponsors on just those two bills alone, you have more than 50 percent of the uh, U.S. House of Representatives that have put their names onto bills co-sponsoring them to reauthorize the Export-Import Bank. That's a very strong showing um, in uh, the House of Representatives. On the Senate side, as was mentioned by Senator Dold, uh, there are six members who are working on a bipartisan bill. Hopefully that bill will be introduced fairly soon, maybe as soon as uh, the next day or two. Um, Senators Kirk, Blunt, Graham, Heitkamp, Donnelly, and Manchin are in discussions on that particular piece of legislation. And we'll work closely with the House and Senate on passing a bill that meets the needs of the wide bipartisan groups while maintaining our ability to support U.S. jobs and meet foreign competition. There's some 60 export credit agencies around the world that are financing their country's exports. We are a critical tool to allow American companies to compete in the global economy. Without us, many companies will lose sales to foreign competitors. The United States cannot afford to unilaterally disarm and leave the 3,000, or I'm sorry, 3,700 companies that we financed last year, again, nearly 90 percent of which were small businesses, without a critical tool to counter their global competition. Foreign export credit agencies around the world are watching this debate. They would love nothing more than for Export-Import Bank of the United States to go away. They would love to be able to scoop up those jobs that are out there that we financed uh, and take them to their country, take them over to France or South Korea or China. Um, and we can't afford to allow that to happen. So we look forward to working with our broad bipartisan group of supporters in Congress to ensure that we can continue to support American products and American jobs for many years to come. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Um, Linda, thanks for coming up from Philadelphia to be with us. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dan. I appreciate the, uh, the invitation to be a, a part of this very important uh, uh, panel uh, discussion. Uh, and I also uh, want to uh, salute uh, Congressman Dole for his, his uh, leadership. Uh, when the invitation came to me to, to come here to, uh, to Washington, uh, I felt I couldn't miss that opportunity. Uh, as my uh, bio uh, reflects, I, I spent uh, from 2004 to 2009 at the bank, the last three years of the bank, as uh, not only a member of the board, but as vice chair of the Export-Import Bank. Uh, so I, I walked away uh, with, with two things, uh, knowing how important the programs and services are of the bank to U.S. exporters, both small and large, and with a, a, a fundamental appreciation for the 400-plus uh, dedicated public servants with whom uh, I had the uh, the pleasure and the honor to uh, to work. Uh, I've been I've had the the uh, privilege of working within the federal government in a number of capacities, but I dare say that the, the individuals at XM Bank represent a particular dedicated uh, group of, of public servants. Uh, so now I'm at the World Trade Center of Greater Philadelphia, and now I get the chance to really work with companies, many of them small and medium-sized businesses, helping them to have access to trade counseling, market research, uh, business networking events, educational seminars and conferences, all with an eye to uh, helping them uh, op uh, engage in markets uh, worldwide. In any given year, we work with 400 to 500 businesses, again, most of them small and medium-sized businesses, uh, and we're part of a worldwide network of over 100 World Trade Centers in some 300 countries, all focused on expanding global business opportunities for the companies that we, that we serve. And if we take a look at the metro Philadelphia region, it generates about $25 billion worth of uh, exports. Uh, that was in, in 2013. As, as a World Trade Center, we cover both New Jersey as well as Pennsylvania. And if we look at our track record at the World Trade Center of Greater Philadelphia, since 2002, we've helped companies generate 
about $1.3 billion in incremental export sales, largely through the counseling that we, that we provide uh, to them. So we're pretty pr proud of that record. And one of the first things I did in Philadelphia when I, I came to the World Trade Center of Greater Philadelphia was to make sure that we had an export finance program. And uh, we're proud to be a city-state partner along with the Export-Import Bank. And uh, each year we put on seminars and workshops where we really uh, run through the, the various ways that, uh, that XM is able to support their global, global business uh, uh, needs and to minimize a risk and to help them expand uh, sales, whether it's through insurance, whether it's through working capital uh, support. Uh, and if you take a look at the number of companies in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, that have been assisted uh, and helped through XM's programs, uh, over the past seven years, there have been some 316 Pennsylvania companies uh, that have been helped through XM Bank that supported about $7 billion in exports. Similarly, in New Jersey, about 244 companies have been assisted during that time, representing some $5 billion in exports supported. The majority of those companies have been small and medium-sized uh, businesses. And I'd like to end with just some facts to, to put things in perspective. And, and certainly Scott has shared some very important facts about uh, the benefit and the importance and the value of the work that XM does. But let's just put this in context. What we're talking about is maintaining, advancing U.S. global competitiveness. 83% of global growth will take place outside of the United States uh, over the next five years. Companies that export, on average, their employees earn 18% higher uh, salaries. Uh, SMEs that export demonstrate greater revenue growth than those that do not export. Uh, in fact, uh, if you look at those companies during the, the, the time of the recession, of our recent recession, SMEs uh, who exported grew 37 percent, while those that did not had experienced a 7 percent decline uh, in, in exports. Uh, exports spur innovation. Those exporting companies um, tend to innovate more than those uh, who do not export. And we talked about earlier about competition from other countries. Uh, China has increased over the past 10 years its export finance support by some 800 percent. That's not going to stop. That's only going to grow. So the congressman made the point. Certain, certainly Scott has made the point a, as well. It's very important to us that we maintain this very valuable uh, tool for U.S. Uh, exporters. Thank you, Jan. Thank you. Don, you, uh, you're a small business. You work with Exim Bank. Can you talk about how you work with the Exim Bank and, and why, uh, why you're here today? Sure. Thank you. Well, thanks to everyone for coming and taking the, uh, the interest and time to learn more about the uh, importance of Exim Bank. Uh, my name is Don Nelson, and I serve as president of Ramsgate Engineering and Pro Gauge Technologies based out of Bakersfield, California. Uh, we're a company that uh, manufactures uh, specialty equipment for the heavy oil industry. Uh, we mostly export to the Middle East. Um, we've been working with Exxon Bank since about 2008. And I can tell you without Exxon Bank, we would not have exported anything. Uh, ex ex the Exxon Bank has allowed us uh, to take on these contracts. Um, I'm also um, was uh, nominated this year to serve on the uh, advisory committee of the XM Bank, and I I have to uh, to say that I'm here uh, speaking on behalf of myself individually and for my company, not on behalf of the bank. Um, I have no authority to speak on behalf of the bank, uh, so I just want to make sure that's clear. Um, one of the things that keeps coming up is that private banks. Um, can take over and, and fill the, the need. Um, <clears throat> I have to say that <clears throat> it's not true. Um, when we landed our first contract in the country of Oman, it was about an $8.6 million contract. And um, we had to put up a bank guarantee um, from, from a local company, a local bank in the country we're working in. <clears throat> 
And the only way we could do that was to issue a letter of credit from our bank of the United States to that foreign bank. So I came back home, went to our bank and told them what I needed to do. And they said, sure, we can do that, but it's gonna require 100% collateral. So 100% collateral is, is not possible for us to continue to operate if we're gonna put all the money as collateral. They said, you might go try some of the smaller regional banks. Um, I happened to bank with Wells Fargo. Um, so I went to the regional banks in our community and none of them would touch it because it was an international bank and they weren't comfortable with, with the risk. Um, <clears throat> they recommended um, that I go back to the foreign country and meet with uh, the banks again and see if there was some way that they, we could work something out with them. So, so I did, I went back to Oman, I met with the CEO managing director of one of the largest banks in Oman <clears throat> and they said, yeah, no problem. We, we can help you do this and you will not have to put up 100% collateral. And I thought, great, we've got this solved. And then, and then he brought up the terms of the deal, which was 25% uh, interest and they controlled all the money for the project. So obviously that wouldn't work either. That's, that's a non-starter. So, <clears throat> Um, at the 11th hour, you know, I went back home. At the 11th hour, I was talking with a friend of mine um, who happens to work at Wells Fargo. And I was telling him the story, and he says, well, you belong with the international guys in San Francisco. Um, they're the ones that could probably find a solution for you. So I ended up talking to them, and sure enough, they said, well, you might qualify for a program with, in the XM Bank. And I've never heard of the XM Bank before. <clears throat> and uh, so anyway, that, that worked seamlessly. It worked very easily. Um, so the private market is not a solution for small businesses to, to do these foreign exports. It simply doesn't work. Um, um, I was actually in the Middle East last week um, at an oil and gas trade show. And on my way back, I, did, I just started writing notes um, about some of the discussions that are going around about the XM Bank. And <clears throat> if you don't mind, I might just read some of this rather than try to wing it because I probably would leave a lot out. Um, so one of the other things that comes up is crony capitalism, um, that it's only for the politically connected. Um, this is not true. Um, we've been using the XM Bank for about seven or eight years. And the first time I've ever talked to anyone from the XM Bank was about six months ago. Um, so I don't, I don't see how anyone could say that only the politically connected um, and the cronies can use the bank. It's, uh, most small businesses don't even know people at the XM Bank because they work through their local bank as we do. So, so sorry, Don, you want to just clarify, you're not a crony, is that, that correct? <laughs> I'm, I, I think that I'm speaking for myself and thousands of other small businesses like ours. So yes, you're correct. Um, also, any, any business in America that has a product they want to export and they have a solid business, um, I'm sure the Exxon Bank would be happy to work with you as long as you're, you know, the financials and all that stuff are in order. Um, they're there to help small businesses export, so um, it's not just for a select few, it's for American businesses. Um, the other thing that comes up a lot is corporate welfare. Um, I believe this is also a false statement uh, for the following reasons. We pay fees for the services we use at the bank. Um, everything we do with the bank, um, they charge a fee for. They make a profit on it. Um, every transaction we do with the bank, they make a profit on it. Um, that we get absolutely nothing for free. Um, the, re the bank has returned billions to the treasury um, and it's creating thousands of good paying American jobs. So corporate welfare <clears throat> is a false statement as well. Another thing that comes up a lot is risk for the American taxpayer 
um, some of the critics say it's not fair to the ta for the taxpayers to, to take this liability or risk of the Exim Bank supporting American businesses. Um, <clears throat> for ourselves and thousands of other companies like us, we have to submit corporate and personal financials to our local bank. They completely vet our credit worthiness before submitting our application to the Exim Bank. We have to guarantee our letter of credit with a corporate guarantee and with a personal guarantee. So the reality of the of risk to the taxpayers is next to nil. In reality, the Exim Bank exposure is spread across dozens of countries and companies. So if a company or country ever defaulted, it's merely a blip on their financials. The bank has a default rate of less than a half a percent, and that's better than most private banks. Congress says they want to protect the taxpayers from the risk associated with the Exim Bank, even though the bank has returned billions in profit to the Treasury through the years. It seems like the critics, all they come up with is imaginary problems with the what ifs and ideology that they believe it shouldn't exist. Um, I've personally met with several lawmakers over the past six months, and I haven't met with one yet who really has any substance behind their argument. When we debate it, they tell me that I make good points, but they just philosophically disagree. So far, they have not articulated one I issue that really justifies their position. <clears throat> and speaking on risk to the American taxpayers, which seems to be a, their argument, <clears throat> the Exim Bank has returned billions of dollars to the Treasury, has not lost any money, and when, and when you look at, at risk, um, I don't know if you realize this or not, but the Pentagon released a report a few months back where Washington has spent approximately $100 billion on reconstruction efforts in Afghanistan. It's $100 billion given to Afghanistan, didn't create one American job. So if, if you look at that and you say, okay, well, we've rebuilt in Pakistan, Iraq, who knows what countries. Um, then two weeks ago, the uh, GAO, the General Accounting Office, released a report where Washington has spent $120 billion on waste and fraud, some $80 billion on Medi-Cal and Medicare fraud, and the rest, they just don't know where it went. So it seems like our congressmen should spend their time focusing on real waste in our government, not on a government entity that helps create thousands of American jobs and is very, very little risk to the American taxpayer. <clears throat> it seems like some of the newer congressmen have, that have come to town want to say that they've shrunk big government. Um, I, you know, and one of the ways they, they want to do that, I think, is, um, is closing one of the smallest government entities, entities there is, the XM Bank. That therefore they can say we're, we've shrunk big government. Um, the reality, though, is they're, they're talking about closing the government entity that creates thousands of jobs, returns hundreds of, th hundreds of millions of dollars a year to the Treasury. It, it seems like their, their focus is, is wrong. They, they need to focus on waste other than an entity that, that actually creates job. Um, from an ideal, ideological perspective, they're saying the government should be involved with financing of private business exports. The critics say the government shouldn't be involved with export finance of private companies. And in a perfect world, this may be true, but we have to live with reality. And the reality is we live in a global economy where all industrialized nations have export credit agencies just like our Exim Bank. If we close our Exim Bank, we will lose the jobs associated with these exports, and that's hundreds of thousands of lost jobs. And those unemployed folks are likely to go onto some form of government subsidy program because there aren't hundreds of thousands of manufacturing jobs just waiting for them to move to. Um, the uh, Exim Bank supported uh, jobs create um, these XM Bank-supported exports create good-paying good American jobs and 
um, these jobs just simply go away if the Exim Bank closes. And I can speak for myself that if Exim Bank goes away, we will no longer be exporting. Um, you know, we have, we were about 100 people. Um, uh, and with the current oil price situation, um, we're down to about 80. Um, but if we stop exporting, we'll probably, you know, that's probably going to be an additional 50 people that we will no longer need. Um, you know, I believe most governments are smart enough to know the best way to create new jobs and grow their economy is through exports. So their credit agencies are much more aggressive in supporting their business than ours is. As an example, Korea provided five times more export finance support to its exporters than, the, than America did for U.S. exporters, despite Korea having an economy less than one-tenth the size of America. China, in the last two years, supported more exports than our XM Bank has in the past 80 years. Those are pretty bad statistics, if you ask a small businessman. Um, if we close the XM Bank, we will be the only industrialized nation without an export credit agency. This obviously will allow our competing countries to win the projects and the jobs. It seems we're also the only industrialized nation considering closing their export credit agency. So to me, anyone with common sense can see this isn't a smart move for America. If I'm taking too much time, Dan, just tell me. Um, another thing that, uh, that they say is government picks winners and losers. Um, the critics say the government shouldn't pick winners and losers. And this is another example, in my opinion, of them not understanding the reality of the global business environment we live in. <clears throat> the Exim Bank does not pick winners and losers between American businesses. All American businesses that have American-made products or technology with a solid and stable business has access to the Exim Bank. However, if Congress shuts down our Exim Bank, Congress will have chosen the winners and losers. Congress will have chosen America to lose and all other exporting countries to win. The other countries get the exports and the jobs. It's that simple. The Exim Bank has flourished through the Great Recession, the internet bubble, the banking crisis, the housing bubble, and has been around for 80 years, operating successfully, profitably, and creating American jobs. Closing it makes no sense. <clears throat> it seems several folks in our Congress make decisions based on ideology, regardless of the reality and the facts of the situation. We cannot and will not have a successful economy in America if Congress doesn't make decisions based on the reality we're dealing with. Congress needs to start using common sense and good business judgment. The United States of America is one of the largest businesses in the world, and one has to wonder if we have too many people in Congress with little to no business experience, little to no common sense, and truthfully unconcerned, they're going to destroy our economy and our country due to their poor judgment based on politics alone. <clears throat> I may get kicked off the advisory committee after some of these statements, but, I, <laughs> but I'm okay because I think these things need to be said. Some say the uh, Exim Bank only supports 1.6 to 2% of all exports, and this may be true, but a 2% drop in GDP can also cause a recession. So these exports are very important, and they create thousands of American jobs. Um, I don't know how much time I've taken, Dan, but I'm good? Okay, I'll stop. So basically, Congress needs to do what's right and reauthorize the Exim Bank, and they need to reauthorize it without demanding unrealistic changes that prevent it from operating successfully. Thanks for your time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Thanks for coming in from California to, to be with us today. You're welcome. Linda, you're with the National Association of Manufacturers. I, th I think you guys have a view on the Exim Bank. We do as, as well. Uh, and uh, the National Association of Manufacturers, for those who might not know, is the largest U.S. industrial association. We represent over 14,000 manufacturers in every part of the manufacturing economy in our country and every single state. Um, manufacturing remains an economic powerhouse for the United States and fuels more than 12 million jobs. Last year we had a record level of nearly $2.1 trillion in manufacturing output 
And we had the highest level ever of manufacturing exports at $1.4 trillion. Those exports, that, those manufacturing exports provide good paying, some of the highest paying jobs across the manufacturing economy. And Exim Bank is an important and increasingly growing part of the success of America's manufacturers and our export success. You heard some great comments today with which I agree um, full heartedly about the types of benefits that the Exim Bank provides at a fee, at an interest, in a self-sustaining manner that pays for itself. Let me give you a few more, because most of our members at the NAM are small businesses. Some of those businesses have only recently started exporting. And when they've exported, what we've heard are stories of success, stories of job growth, and stories about wanting to continue to do so. Consider the case of WallQuest, a company in Wayne, Pennsylvania, about 20 minutes from where I grew up, that is a family-owned company. Um, back in 2008, WallQuest was an 80-person company, and they began using XM Bank working capital services because commercial banks will not provide to an ex will not use the export as collateral and so these companies like Wallquest, Wallquest can't get uh, these types of loans um, and working capital services from their own commercial bank. Within four years, WallQuest, which produces wall coverings uh, to countries around the world, has more than doubled its employment to 185 employees, and 90% of its American-made wall coverings are sold overseas. And as the WallCrest Vice President Jack Collins told us, WallQuest's growth not only provided new employment for WallQuest, it helped WallQuest raw material suppliers here in the United States. It helped the local services economy in Wayne, Pennsylvania and nearby counties because WallQuest was growing more and needed more services. Consider the case of Lion Precision, a 30 employee, employee company founded in 1958 in Minnesota. It was the first company to ever provide, create a capacitive displacement center, sensor. What's that? It measures very small distances, very important for all the type of precision manufacturing a vast array of, of companies used throughout the United States and, yes, around the world. Over 40 percent of Lion Precision sales are now overseas. Their president, Don Martin, has told us that because of the Exim Bank, which provides receivables insurance to them, they can complete transactions in hours with foreign customers because they have that guarantee that they will be able to be paid for their exports when they go overseas. And by streamlining his export processes, Don has been able to advance and expand this company's exports over the last number of years. One last company I'll mention right now, because we've already heard from Don, who, who has told a great story. But consider the company Air Tractor in Olney, Texas. They employ 260 of the 3,000 residents in Olney, and I think uh, we've heard from, from them that they, uh, there's maybe one uh, uh, light in, in the town. They use the medium-term credit insurance so that they can extend credit to foreign customers in the form of a promissory note payments to Air Tractor. And once Air Tractor has that XM credit, they can sell that note to their commercial bank for cash. Since 1995, when Air Tractor first started using XM sales, they grew their exports from 10 percent to nearly 50 percent of all their sales and have created 65 jobs in this small town in Olney. Air Tractor Vice President for Finance Dave Eckert has expressed his concerns that if XM is not reauthorized, it could mean the difference between a thriving town or a community in decline. And those are the stories that we at the NAM hear every day from our members as well as many others in the manufacturing and other small businesses throughout this country. Without the bank, many aspiring manufacturers in the United States would find themselves excluded from the global economy, where frankly the odds are increasingly stacked against them. The level of support provided by Exim Bank is dwarfed by that of our international co competitors. You heard Don and Linda talk about this. Last year, NAM commissioned a report to analyze our nine largest uh, competitors in this area to see what they're doing. There are more than 60 foreign export credit agencies operating right now. Our top 
trading partners provide nearly half a trillion dollars in assistance annually, more than 18 times the size of the Export-Import Bank. China alone provides at least five times more support for its exporters than the XM Bank does and fuels more than 12 percent of China's exports through export credit agency support. Canada fuels 20 percent of its exports through its export credit support. Meanwhile, the XM Bank, as you've heard, impacts about 2 percent of U.S. exports, but yields huge results and supports millions of jobs. It is a targeted and last resort tool which helps our businesses find a foothold in a competitive global economy that is just becoming tougher. Unfortunately, the future of this job creating tool is now at risk as we are approaching the deadline uh, that Congress had last set. America, and particularly Congress, has a question before it. And for the NAM, the answer seems simple. Do we want manufacturers in the United States to win sales overseas that will sustain and grow American jobs? Or do we want our foreign competitors and their foreign workers to win those jobs? That's the question that Congress has before them. We appreciate the work that we've seen in both the House and the Senate to move forward legislation. There is, as Congressman Dold said, rank and file support of a majority of Democrats and Republicans in both the House and Senate that will support XM reauthorization once it comes to the floor. Congress needs to move now because the uncertainty that is being created by the impending expiration of the Exim Bank's authorization is costing our manufacturers right now opportunities for new sales. And it's going to cost us jobs here in the United States. Congress needs to act now. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I wanted to put a couple questions to the audience, and then I'm going to open it up uh, because I know there's a very knowledgeable audience. Um, could I get some reactions t from the panel about the critique about 70 percent of the portfolio? I will. I want to hear from Scott about this, but I'd like to hear from someone other than Scott about this as well. About when when the criticism is 70 percent of the portfolio is with 10 companies. What, you, what is your response to that? Maybe Linda, both Lindas might might chime in. If Don, you want to comment on that as well, that's fine as well. But please go ahead. I'm happy to start. Erla, do you want to start? The fact that, or, or the point that I, I remember from the congressman's remarks uh, today was that when a Boeing aircraft lands, uh, 19,000 small businesses land with it. Um, the fact is that, that the larger transactions support a lot of suppliers and subsuppliers, and many of these suppliers are small and medium-sized businesses. And one other fact that is often mis, uh, misunderstood or, or, or not uh, or overlooked is that the fees that the XM Bank receives on these larger transactions uh, go back to support uh, the operation of the bank, which supports 90 percent of, of authorizations go to small and medium-sized uh, businesses. And, and I know from being on the ground uh, there in, in Philadelphia and working with small and medium-sized businesses, uh, there's a lot of hand-holding, and rightfully so. So it takes an enormous amount of time to, uh, and, and time well spent, to help these companies uh, really make sure that they understand the tools that are available to them. So uh, I would say these larger transactions enable the bank to, to really dedicate the time and resources to, to help small businesses as well. Linda. Let me second that. Um, you know, uh, there are over 3,300 small businesses, small, medium-sized businesses right now that are growing. I was just talking to uh, a comp company, Draper, out in Indiana, that has now crossed the th threshold from small to medium-sized um, business because it's been able to export more. But certainly we see, and we saw this just a few weeks ago when we, and as part of the XM for, uh, Exporters for XM Coalition, brought in more than 650 folks from outside Washington, D.C. They were the suppliers to 
to many of the larger companies that already use XM. And you hear it, even small companies use suppliers for their, their production, and the larger companies are using tens of thousands of suppliers each. Many of those uh, companies, we call them invisible exporters, don't even realize that their product is going on a, you know, a piece of capital equipment, a, a bulldozer, a plane, anything going overseas. But those companies and their communities and all the companies they rely on also benefit from this. Uh, I think Linda and Linda both articulated very well some uh, great points and pushback to this. Uh, the fact of the matter is also that uh, in addition to the fact that all of these medium and large businesses have tens of thousands of suppliers, many of which are extremely uh, good paying jobs, family sustaining jobs. Uh, when you slice the data the way that they've sliced it in order to get this, this statistic, they take a look at our entire portfolio uh, over the, um, uh, that our entire portfolio and exposure right now. And that excludes a large chunk of the small business because that's short-term transactions that kind of roll on and roll off within 12-month time frame. So they're just looking at the larger, longer-term transactions when they use this data. Uh, but as, um, as both Linda and Linda pointed out, um, the fact of the matter is, is that financing uh, supports tens of thousands of family sustainable jobs. Can you talk about the issue of crowding out? I mean, this is, when I worked at IFC, the development finance institution, sometimes this comes up with OPIC, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, that, that institutions like Exim Bank are crowding out the private sector. Um, Don obviously told a story that doesn't necessarily comport with that that does not comport with that critique, but maybe I might ask, can I ask both of the Lindas to comment on this issue, of, on this issue of crowding out, if I could? I think there is a, mis, a big misperception uh, there. Uh, first of all, uh, XM Bank, uh, while they do make some direct loans, the large majority of the loans that they provide uh, are in the form of loan guarantees, rather, that the loans are made by commercial banks, uh, and many of these banks would not be able or not, would not be willing to provide these loans, particularly to small and medium-sized businesses, because the amounts of the loans are, are smaller, and yet the administrative work is still there. So without XM Bank's support, they would be reluctant to make these kinds of, of, of loans. Uh, to our, our small businesses. A and I work day in and day out with many of the leading trade finance banks who help companies in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. And I don't know how many times, you know, they've shared with me, look, we want this business, but it's just too costly. So we need, we need the XM Bank. Let me add, you know, there are um, several types of instances where, where we really see that, that commercial banks continuing to refuse and not be interested. Talked about already the fact that um, commercial banks will not give small business exporters working capital, except if they take that collateral of the export, and so that, that's basically an un unworkable si situation. We also see several other in instances when companies are trying to sell beyond the developed world to Africa, the Middle East, Latin America, countries where there's a bit more risk, uh, a lot of commercial lenders will not be doing that. Well, we've already done a loan into West Africa. We're not doing another one for the next few years. And so that is an op that is a, a opportunity where Exim Bank needs to fill in or we will lose those sales to foreign competitors. Another big area is big infrastructure, complex, multi-year types of um, uh, deals that are going on outside our borders, it's an area where the United States really uh, wants to participate more but has not been able to as much. And this is an area where uh, commercial banks, again, are not providing the, the direct types of um, funding, financing uh, that's required. The last one is, you know, a lot of our companies sell to state-owned enterprises, foreign governments, um, and a small medical uh, rehabilitation equipment up, uh, producer up in Maryland, BTE Technologies, will tell you, you know, a lot of their equipment goes to state-owned hospitals. That state-owned hospital needs to see a government entity at the other side of the table. And lots of these other, you know, their competitors around the world, their export credit agencies are right there. Sometimes you don't even need the, the services that Exim provides, but just partly being in the room when you're trying to make these sales. 
I think um, to follow up on whether XM is crowding out commercial banks, um, I think it's the statistic is like in the high 90s, the percentage of all transactions are in conjunction with the commercial bank. So the commercial banks are not being crowded out. Um, that's, that's not a true statement. Let me ask, uh, I know that Exim Bank responds to the real economy. And so it's not a question of Exim Bank saying, well, I want to do more in Africa or I want to do more in the Middle East. Uh, and is responding sort of ch to globalization. It's a vector for globalization. It's a f in some ways a fuel injector for globalization. But could e each of you very briefly talk about when you talk to either, either as a company or as you're talking to members of your association or member, if you could just talk a little bit about what, if, if it was reauthorized, what are the sorts of activities you expect to see going forward? Maybe I'll start with you, Scott, and we'll just go down the panel. Sure. Well, we, we have uh, a significant pipeline right now of projects that are long-term projects uh, that we would expect to come forward over the next several years. Many of the projects, the structured finance projects, are large, uh, whether it's like a large LNG facility or a nuclear power plant or a uh, mining operation. Those all take many, many years to both, you know, kind of become fully baked. And so they'll start coming to XM to talk to us uh, several years out. Same thing with aircraft. Um, but then, again, you have the uh, thousands and thousands of small business transactions that would go on, um, which are much more difficult to predict further out. But there, there are a lot of structured finance projects out there. Let me just call in a little audible. I'm just going to ask Linda Conlon to answer this, and then I'm going to go out to the rest of the audience, if you guys don't mind. So, Linda, when you talk to your members, when they say, I want to use XM Bank, what are the sorts of things you're seeing out there in terms of where you think you're going to see what you're going to see, what are the kinds of activities you're going to see more of if it, if it was reauthorized? Well, certainly, and, and Linda commented on this uh, that uh, XM is is there to to uh, to level the playing field and to and to operate in markets that are perceived to be of greater risk. So I can see as our exporters mature uh, and as they expand from one to two to three to four markets, they're certainly going to uh, look at markets that, that are, are riskier. And there, I think, is where XM is going to also uh, play a role. They're always going to look for reasonable reassurance uh, of, of repayment and do, and do prudent uh, underwriting, but I think that's where they can be helpful. And let me just give you one example of, of, of a company that's now uh, working more in, 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 the, in developed, uh, developing uh, markets, and that's Bassett's Ice Cream. And thank you, Linda, for mentioning WallQuest, which is one of our I, I eat Bassett's Ice Cream, but <laughs> I'm a happy Good. customer. I hope you yeah. do a lot. I hope all of you out there are familiar with Bassett's Ice Cream. They produce some, some, some terrific ice cream. They were actually founded in 1861, yet it wasn't until 2008 that they just began to, uh, to export. And now, with the help of XM's uh, single buyer policy, getting receivables insurance, uh, China now makes up 20 percent of the ice cream, ho of this ice cream wholesaler's business, and they're looking at markets like, uh, like uh, Vietnam uh, and other markets in Asia. Who would think ice cream from Philadelphia going into China around the world? But it really, I have to say this sincerely, was made possible with the, the comfort level that they received uh, through uh, export receivables insurance, now looking at working capital uh, opportunities. But I hope we'll have an opportunity to talk about looking to the future and what we will need from, from XM Bank as well. Okay. Yeah, why don't we just spend a minute on that, because I do want to hear from the audience. Let's talk about what, what, do you, what do we need in terms of a future XM Bank, because I do think this is, maybe I might ask the Lindas and Don to answer the, the question of what, what, what improvements do you need or what are the sorts of things you want to see in a future XM Bank, if, if you, in terms of, certainly it's there have been significant efforts to, and people are happy with Exim Bank, but what are the sorts of things you'd like to see in the future? When I start with you, Linda Dempsey. <laughs> sure, thank you. I mean, look, uh, you know, in 2012, when Exim was reauthorized, it, it underwent about um, 18 reforms, and we did a, a checklist on that. Uh, it met all of those reforms. But companies uh, continue to see areas where we can have improvement, improved communication. Um, I mean, they've done so much to uh, attract the small businesses, and it's hard to get small businesses who haven't been exporting to get that type of comfort level. 
Um, but we we would see some streamlining of um, you know policies and in, in on the communication side, on on responsiveness side, also looking at broadening the scope of Exim Bank's operation. Dual use is an area where we uh, sell to our allies overseas, but we just don't have financing available for that, and and that's an important area where we're we're looking to see some some broadening. Don. Yeah, I'd like to respond to your other question real okay. quick. And going forward, um, from from our perspective, um, we're just starting on the engineering for a project in the Middle East for a steam plant, and they're expected to order the equipment fourth quarter this year. Probably it's going to be anywhere between thirty and fifty million dollar order. If Exim Bank is not reauthorized, that's that's an order we will not be able to fulfill, and and there's a lot of jobs associated with that. Um, as far as going forward with the bank, um, it, it would be nice if, uh, and I don't know if it's possible, but if the bank could help support small businesses um, uh, in, in a marketing fashion to let these foreign countries know that the XM Bank is, is here to support the small businesses. Um, and the reason I say that is um, we lost a job to China because their export credit agency uh, went to that country and and closed the deal for them. So, Linda. First of all, I, I think uh, XM is is, and as you can tell, I'm a big fan of of of, of the bank, understandably uh, so. Uh, but it's doing a great job in trying to reach out to a small and medium sized uh, businesses. It's it's a, it's a huge. Uh, huge task, but I think uh, over the last several years, I've seen really XM expand its efforts to reach small and, and, and medium-sized uh, businesses. Uh, and I would continue those efforts. Uh, I would strengthen uh, those, those efforts. Uh, I think uh, part of the challenge is not that there is a lack of resources, but that more companies need to know that those resources exist. It's true of the U.S. Department of Commerce efforts. It's true of our efforts to reach more companies. It's certainly true of XM. So I would say continue doing that. But please, our respected members of Congress, um, do not embed in the legislation reforms that represent a lot of belts, what I call belts and suspenders. Yes, make sure that the process is transparent. Make sure that uh, the bank is always accountable to U.S. taxpayers, but do not embed the legislation with the number of reforms that make it so that the bank is focusing more on, on, on uh, being uh, responsive to these reforms and less on the business of helping U.S. exporters succeed uh, abroad. I think that's very important. Continue XM Bank on increasing the turnaround time. Time is money. You know that, Don. The time between the request for the financing to the actual financing being given, you're making great strides in improving the turnaround time. That's absolutely, absolutely uh, uh, essential. So you're doing a lot of things very well. Continue to do them. And Congress, please, in your wisdom, make sure that the legislation doesn't uh, prevent uh, the bank from doing the, the important work that they need to do. Okay, I want to hear from a couple folks from the United States. I want to hear from my friend Mima and Nadalkovich, and I want to hear from this woman. These two folks are going to are going to be the two comments. And name, rank, serial number, and keep it brief. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Mima Nadalkovich, president of the Initiative for Global Development. We're a worldwide network of uh, business leaders, CEOs investing in Africa. Um, Twenty-five years ago, I was USCD, the African Development Bank. And in between years, we come back to XM, structuring agro-industrial developments throughout Africa. In fact, Air Tractor was a supplier to one of our projects with a Schaefer group out of Louisiana. I'm baffled. I must say, and I'm sorry we don't have the opposite sort of picture on the, on the panel. I don't understand what the argument's about. If we are speaking of markets that are tough to penetrate, we speak of Africa, we're talking about a continent that will be doubling in size, I don't know how many six of the ten fastest growing economies, the most difficult place, and I can imagine Don going to his bank and saying, never mind, Oman, I won't export to Guinea, to tell you to walk out the door, I would imagine. Yes. So why are we even having this discussion? I would argue, in fact, the very opposite. That really, the XM Bank needs to get more into it. You know, if business is, it's a peaceful warfare. You want to be competitive. Why are we unilaterally disarming? I'm conservative, but I don't understand this argument. I'd like to hear why, what is the argument 
for not doing so, particularly for saying we want to go into the tough markets, we want to go into Africa, renewable energies, very high risk. The commercial banks will not cover that. that. And I've got to see how Exim Bank and somebody make a logical argument on the Bloody Hill. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to catch this person and then we're going to give Scott a chance to respond. Go ahead. Good morning. My name is Diane Katz. I'm with the Heritage Foundation. And this morning, the panel and Representative Dold have understandably focused on um, the domestic firms that benefit from XM. I'm wondering if the panel could talk a bit about uh, the competitive advantages that foreign firms get vis-a-vis um, -vis U.S. firms um, in terms of the subsidies that enable them to um, have lower operational costs and thus um, you know, outcompete U.S. firms. Yep. Sure. Um, when it comes to XM financing, XM will finance uh, any of the U.S. content of an export that's going out of the U.S. Uh, so that's a, for goods and services. So even if you're a foreign company, uh, such as Siemens, which we do a lot of work with on renewable energy, we're happy to finance their renewable energy exports out of the United States because they're made in North Carolina where workers down there are benefiting from uh, the financing that we would provide. With regard to the, to the comment about uh, difficult areas, you know, 68, more than 68 percent of our financing last year went into emerging markets. Mm -hmm. Of that, 63 percent of that financing was for small businesses. Mm -hmm. And you're absolutely right, because when in those difficult markets, in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, uh, you know, we financed a number of fire trucks to um, Lagos, Nigeria that were made by um, a small company called Darley Fire Trucks up in, in Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin. Other, finan other products that we're financing into those countries are extremely important, both from a, uh, you know, clean water, water purification systems that we're doing in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, other, finance other uh, products that we're financing in there. It's both providing a service and goods for uh, sustainability, providing power for people in, in Africa, uh, but it's also building brain, brand uh, recognition and getting in on the ground floor of what is probably the last kind of untapped market out there. And so it's either going to be U.S. companies that are exporting to these emerging markets and, and building brand loyalty, or it's going to be Chinese or Korean companies uh, that are going to be exporting there. And, you know, we want them to think of uh, the U.S. products, whether it's GE or Coca-Cola or whatever the case may be, rather than Huawei or other uh, countries' uh, brands that they're exporting. Linda Collum. Sorry, sorry, Linda Dempsey, excuse me. <laughs> sure. Um, let's be clear. Exim financing is not a subsidy. You want to talk about China's export credit agency, Brazil, someone like that, that's, that's a subsidy. The U.S. government for decades has led the world in making sure that the types of fees and interest levels that the developed wor world, the OECD nations are using, and they just did this recently in aircraft as well, is based on competitive market rates. No subsidy, period. In terms of the, the question about, well, you're disadvantaging others, um, what we're talking about is foreign transactions that are happening anyway. So if you're a foreign airline and you're purchasing aircraft, the question that XM Bank helps America solve is whether those aircraft will be produced in the United States with U.S. workers or they'll be produced overseas. These transactions are going forward. That's true with every other transaction out there. They're going forward, and the question is whether we're going to lose an opportunity to sustain and create really good paying American manufacturing and other jobs and help thousands, tens thousands of thousands of suppliers in some cases, or we're going to let that all go overseas. The United States has 9% of the world share in manufactured trade today. We should be doing a lot better, and if we can, we are going to grow millions of more good paying jobs. That's what we should focus on. Linda Common, do you want to respond? Uh, a lot of great points have been mentioned, but uh, let me just, just add, uh, the most frustrating time I had at XM Bank was when a company would walk into my office and say, Linda, I want to be doing business, major communications, or communications company. We have these contracts uh, in Africa, but we are really being edged out of the market by China because of the 
term length to the, to the financing, which far exceeded what XM Bank was, was being able to do. So to, to the point of the question that was asked, yes, we are having to compete not only with, within the OECD, but with non-OECD uh, uh, countries who are providing what I think is predatory uh, uh, financing uh, to their companies. So all the more reason for us to really, really uh, be, be sure that XM can continue to, to offer I its uh, financing programs. Don, do you want to, you want to comment? I, I think that the three have covered it pretty well, and then there's more okay. questions. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask, I'm actually going to ask Fred Hochberg, who's here as the chairman of the Exim Bank, to come on up and make some remarks. Fred, please come on up. Thanks for, Thanks for being here. Thanks. Go ahead. The floor is yours. Well, good morning. I would have been here earlier, because this is a great conversation, I attended a, uh, a Sweet 16 party last night. Uh, my mother turned 88. <laughs> so I, I figured it was really a Sweet 16 party. Um, this is an amazing panel. As I've been listening in the back room, I've been scribbling down notes. Um, Linda Conlon was a spectacular vice chair of the bank. Um, she left just before I got uh, sworn in. Um, and when she talks about reforms, um, I think the key thing is, as Linda very well pointed out, is let's make sure we're not hurting small businesses, let's make sure we're not hurting our competitive list, and let's show we're not bogging ourselves down with bureaucracy. You know, in terms of, we put in a dozen reforms three years ago, about, which are more transparent, um, uh, looking at our default rates and so forth, those are all good. We just wanna make sure we don't do things that actually cripple the business. Uh, and uh, Don, I got a chance to know because uh, he's a great exporter and has been using us and, and uh, demonstrates. I was so impressed when I met him. We put him on our advisory committee and he uh, was here last week for that. And I see Pat Louis in the front row who's also uh, our, one of our directors who uh, President Obama just renominated for another term uh, just last week. Um, so at this point, you all pretty much have a good idea of what we do. You know, we're the official export of credit agency of the United States, um, and we work with small and large companies, but as uh, has been mentioned here, and Scott, uh, as our chief of staff mentioned, you know, 90% of our customers are small businesses. Um, and we produce some of the best and most innovative products and quality products and delivery, and deliver them on time and deliver them transparently than probably any other country in the entire world. And we create a lot of really good jobs in the, as a result. And in fact, uh, yesterday, as I said, we had an advisory committee meeting, and one of our other small businesses that I met uh, in, the, in the last um, year uh, joined as a company uh, run by a woman named Mary Howe, a family business in Chicago. And I spent a half a day with Mary, and I learned more about the flake ice making business than I ever thought one could. And uh, her company uh, was started by her, well, she's fourth generation, so I'm going to lose track whether that's great, great, great grandfather or just great grandfather. And um, they make the kind of ice you see that fishing boats use or that you'll find at a Whole Foods or a Safeway a seafood counter to make sure it keeps the fish or fresh foods fresh all day. And uh, when the recession hit, in particular, she lost a lot of her sales in 2008, 2009. She'd been exporting, but she really had to step that up because like many business owners, um, and I've heard this over and over again with family businesses, actually, they don't like to fire people. They like to hire people. And important for Mary was not just hiring people, but keeping people on the payroll. So she looked at the 95% of the customers that live outside the United States, and she now exports to 100 countries. But the way she does that is she said, I need to make sure I'm going to get paid. And she could not get what's called credit insurance, the way you'd get fire insurance and theft insurance, credit insurance, where we actually insure receivables from overseas customers so that she knows that she's going to get paid. She can sell an open account 60 days, people get the goods, then they pay her. Um, she now has, she exports to 100 countries. She has, it's a small business. 40 employees, and um, there are thousands and thousands of companies just like that one. Um, 
I want to ask a question this group. I was asked this not too long ago. Anybody remember the car, the DeLorean? Yes, yeah, sure, of course. Anybody own one? <laughs> they didn't sell that many. Um, the reason I mention that is uh, I, when I was in the business, in the catalog business uh, 20, 30 years ago, a friend of mine owned a DeLorean. God, it was in the late 80s. And we had a board meeting for the trade association. I uh, said, I want to show you the car. So I go out to the parking lot and I look at the car. It's a beautiful stainless steel car with those gold wing doors. And, and uh, I look at the license plate and the license plate says Plan B. I said, Michael, why is the license plate Plan B? He said, Fred, Plan A was this was going to be a company car. They didn't buy it, so Plan B was I bought the car. <laughs> the reason I thought of that is I was at a panel just like this at the Chamber of Commerce and somebody said to me, well, what happens if the Exim Bank isn't reauthorized? What's plan B? And I thought for a moment, I said, well, frankly, we're plan B. Plan A is the private sector. Plan A, we have the best private sector that with the deepest capital markets, the most liquidity of any private sector banking system in the entire world. But it does not fit every situation and every market, as we've talked about, some of the developing markets and some products or services like Don's company, or frankly Mary's company. She went to the private sector. They were not interested. They were not interested in doing business with her due to the size of her business and the location she was exporting to. So first is plan A, the private sector. We are plan B, unlike that car license plate, because our job is to fill in gaps. Now, we're all in, we all know the alphabet. If there's no plan A and there's no plan B, what's plan C? China. Let's be very clear, that's plan C. If we are not there, if we are not there, China will be very happy to step in and fill in those gaps. And let me give you a little, a quick history on this. Just a dozen years ago, we were the largest exporting country in the entire world. Nobody exported more goods, more manufactured goods, or any kind of goods than the United States. Nobody until 2002. 2002, Germany overtook us. 2010, China overtook D Germany. And frankly, with the strength of manufacturing, the emphasis on exports in the last few years, the, the National Export Initiative, the President Obama champions, we moved back into second place. And frankly, there's no reason we can't go back to first place. Now, in China, uh, exports are about 30% of that economy. In Germany, it's 52% of that economy is exports. Korea, also 57%. Great Britain, lovely country to visit. They don't make a lot of things like we do. 30% exports. Where are we? We're just under 14%. Just under 14%. Do you know who we're tied with? We're tied with Haiti and Rwanda. That's our peer group. So. Just think for a moment, if we get exports up to 15%, 16%, how that turns things around, how that puts more people to work, how that fixes the balance of trade, how that puts a lot of things into place in our country. I liken a little bit to diet and exercise. You know, a little less eating and a little more exercise, and you get into shape much faster. Same with our economy. A little more exports, we, we change the entire mechanism of our economy. Now. There are 59 other export credit agencies around the world. We are not alone. Countries like Russia and China are exceedingly aggressive. And as mentioned up here, they're not members of the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development that sets kind of global framework or rules for export finance. So when I meet with US exporters, when I meet with people like Mary Howe, Don, and others, all they are looking for is a level playing field. And that's all we're trying to do, is make sure there's a level playing field. Now, in the, I want you to think about this number. It's a big number, $600 billion, $600 billion. That is the total amount of loans, insurance, and guarantees the Export Input Bank has done since 1934, 590 to be exact. In the last two years, last two years, China has done $670 billion. In two years, what took us 80, 81 years to do. So we do have formidable competition there. We do have very stiff competition. And I just want to make sure that we can 
support our exporters, support companies like Mary when the private sector is not there or when they're facing the likes of a Chinese competitor who has the backing, the full backing of their government in every way, both sometimes subsidies in the manufacturing project, uh, process as well as on the export finance process. But I believe we can be the number one again, and the benefits of that would be enormous, but not if we don't have a level playing field. Last year, we supported 164,000 jobs through our financing. 164,000 jobs. It's about 500 jobs every day of the year. 164,000 jobs. And we do this at no cost to the taxpayer, as, was, as, uh, was Linda was, as said earlier. We collect a fee for our work, premiums, interest rate, and so forth. We then put aside a loan loss reserve account like any responsible financial institution. Congress says we can keep about $100 million to run the place, and the rest, think about this, revenue minus costs, what's left over? Profit. profit. Problem is, we don't have the word profit in, our, in the government budgeting. It does not exist in the federal budget. So instead of profit, we have a word called negative subsidy. That's, what, that's our word for profit. So, you know, it's like when you go to the doctor and he says everything is negative and you're supposed to feel good. It's the only time, right? So the same thing. Negative subsidy is okay. Positive subsidy is not okay. So last year, we turned over to the Treasury. We delivered to the Treasury. We wired cash to the Treasury, $675 million. That was our profit or negative subsidy. I like the number so much, it's my password. <laughs> Just... Even the C-SPAN audiences, don't tell anyone I gave away my password. My RIT people would not be happy about that. Um, so we want to make sure that companies here and others can grow their business, make long-term plans, invest in, in innovation, uh, and make plans over time. We can't make plans 60, 90 nine months at a time. We have to make long-term plans. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty out there. There's a lot of uncertainty in the global economy. There's a lot of uncertainty in global markets. And we would like to be some form of, of certainty here at home. So thank you for inviting us. Thank you for having this panel. And if you, I have time for questions, if you'd like. Okay, we'll take, we'll take two questions. Okay, we're going to, that gentleman there and this woman here, these two folks. And the deal is you got to keep it brief. Name, rank, and serial number, and keep it brief. Well, I'm an Army officer, so I, I won't give my name and rank and serial number, but um, I'm, I represent some manufacturing companies. My name is Patrick Wilson, and Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm, I applaud your reminder about uh, global competition, and I'm wondering if you or other panelists would like to comment on the recent announcement uh, of the Chinese Infrastructure Bank, uh, $60 billion, uh, the initial commitment to that. Several of our European allies have contributed to that infrastructure bank. How does that change the game for XM competitiveness? And this woman here. Thank you so much, panel, Mr. Chairman. Question for the Chairman. Um, Exim seem to be running a commercially viable establishment, and yet you seem to be a part of the government. I'm calling it quasi-government agency. What are the, is there any thoughts about, or are there rather any thoughts about privatization, privatizing Exim? If the worst case scenario happens, you can compete. And my question to the panel, can you shed some light on the service sector? Their service sec obviously, the service sector has to support manufacturers with goods, brick and mortar things, right? There are soft service providers here in Washington, D.C. that has significant exposure across border because they can't get working capital or risk protection from institutions like Exim. Is that an area that one probably could be thinking of as one has, there is growing demand for a certain type of services abroad, especially in West Africa? Got it. Okay. Okay, I'm going to hear from uh, the chairman. I also want to hear from Linda Conlon to answer the issue of the service sector. Okay. So uh, the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, a uh, bank formed by China. Uh, there's been some more uh, action on it. Listen, we need more money on infrastructure. We need more capital. There's no question about that. So from that point of view, if we have more entities, not just Exim Bank and the 59 or 60 other export credit agencies, that's a good thing. There are concerns, though, the rest of us abide by rules of transparency, rules around the environment, standards around um, social cost and environmental cost. So the unanswered questions are, 
How will that be in any new environment? Will there be a level playing field for any company to bid on projects, or will shareholders of the bank have the upper hand when it comes to bidding? So I think those are some unanswered questions we don't know the answer to. So it's very hard to just have a yes, no answer at the time. So more capital is certainly good, but it's got to be capital that's, that's clear, transparent, and operates in a way such as many of the other export credit agencies do, or the World Bank does, and others. Um, Quick question on private, well, I'll also jump in on services. We do a lot of services. Last year, 5%, three years ago, 30%. So it depends on the year. Um, when it comes to uh, engineering services, a lot of large projects, a large portion of that is services. Engineering fees, architecture fees. We did a power plant in South Africa. The only thing we did was services, the engineering show. Not one bit of material, not one bit of goods, only services. Um, Privatizing the bank, we have a great private sector. We step in when the private sector can't. So the whole point of us is we are there when the private sector is unable to do so and because we're backed by the full faith and credit of the U.N. U.S. government. And okay. I think you wanted Linda, Linda to do you want to make a comment? Uh, interesting uh, question about uh, services. Uh, at the World Trade Center of Greater Philadelphia, we found we're, we're involved right now in, in developing a new export strategy. We're one of the eight metro regions chosen by a Brookings Institution and J.P. Morgan Chase to participate in their Global Cities initiative. And we're finding that something like 44 percent of our uh, exports uh, are uh, in, in the services uh, sector. So we want to look more into that and to see how we can certainly make export financing more available. But I do get asked the questions when we conduct our export finance seminars, uh, well, is this financing also for services? So it's a question that, comp that companies have. Please join me in thanking the panel. I think we need to do a billion dollars into the federal treasury. That, that to me is fantastic. That's exactly the type of program that I think is, is what we're looking for. Very much pro-growth. In the 112th Congress, uh, I actually was one, uh, I sat as the vice chair of the International Monetary Policy and Trade Committee and helped uh, lead the reauthorization of the XM Bank. It was certainly a top priority of mine. Uh, and again, you've heard some of the, the arguments as to why reauthorize. Um, I co-sponsored the Export-Import Bank reauthorization back then. Uh, again, a common sense, bipartisan piece of legislation, one that back then passed the House 330 to 93. So that wasn't some bygone era. That was just a few short years ago. Uh, the arguments for the XM Bank have not changed. Uh, in fact, I believe that there is a majority uh, of the House Republicans uh, that did support, obviously, the XM Bank reauthorization, over 60 percent, and the Senate passed it 78 to 20. So that just kind of puts a, some historical framework and reference around what happened before. Uh, as we look um, going forward, we're looking to obviously have a five-year reauthorization. And again, my clear message to each and every one of you is that the support in Congress is there, and it is bipartisan. But that doesn't mean that we can take reauthorization lightly or we can take it for granted. Uh, we all have to work hard to make the case uh, because the critics of the bank have, are very determined and they've been very organized. So in this Congress, obviously, Congressman Fincher uh, has a bill, uh, and certainly one that I have co-sponsored, it's called H.R. 579, uh, that reforms and expands the export import bank. <coughs> and so as a sponsor of this legislation, uh, I, I, for one, want to just take a step back and talk a little bit about why I think this is a good idea. Why is Export-Import Bank important? Why is it necessary? Many of the critics say, you know, it's, it's only 1.6 percent, represents 1.6 percent of the exports in the United States. Well, as a small business owner, someone that understands meeting a budget and a payroll and trying to make sure that we're hiring more people, I think it's absolutely vital that we're trying to give the tools necessary for some of these small businesses to be able to expand their business and to be able to get their products out to 95 percent of the world's consumers who happen to be outside of the United States. The other thing to look at from my perspective, I, I come from a district where we're the third largest manufacturing district in the nation. 54,000 jobs in the 10th district of Illinois rely upon exports. The Export-Import Bank isn't the end-all be-all. But I can tell you that 86% of the loans that it makes in Illinois go to small.
I'm Dan Rundy. I hold the Schreier Chair here at CSIS. Uh, let me provide a little context for the discussion. I'm going to speak a little longer uh, than I generally would uh, when I moderate an event to set the stage. Um, we're here at a time when the U.S. Congress is debating reauthorization of the Exim Bank, the Export-Import Bank of the United States. If Congress does not reauthorize Exim Bank, it'll close down on July 1. Uh, in a perfect world, Exim Bank would not exist. Uh, traditionally, the Exim Bank has been a vehicle to sell American-made products to countries with limited or no access to capital. The Exim Bank can lend at a risk premium benchmark to commercial rates um, in ways that some banks can't uh, in certain risky circumstances. And as a result, significant percentages of industrial products around the world are financed using export credit agencies such as the Exim Bank. Uh, the Exim Bank does not essentially take any money from the U.S. Congress. Uh, it gets permission to lend up to a certain amount uh, and actually sends hundreds of millions of dollars back uh, in essentially profits each year to the, to the U.S. Treasury. In its 80-year history, Exim Bank has been used to finance the building of the Pan American Highway, had a role in rebuilding Europe after World War II, and helped restart relations with the former Soviet Union after the Cold War. Uh, I want to highlight three reasons that proponents use in favor of authorization. Uh, the first is the hundreds of thousands of jobs directly linked to Exim Bank financing. The second, there are 60 export credit agencies around the world, including in China and all of our OECD uh, partners and competitors. Uh, we should not be in the business, is one of the arguments, that we should unilaterally disarm our export credit agency, the Exim Bank. Um, there's a concept in nuclear weapons uh, uh, policy called uh, nuclear zero, which to seeks to zero out all nuclear weapons, and I don't see nuclear zero for export credit agencies any time in the next 20 years. Um, the other reason, the third reason, is that Exim Bank serves as fuel injection for U.S. engagement with developing countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America who are seeking to participate in globalization. However, if someone wanted to close a government agency, this is one that has a number of features that makes it vulnerable to critiques and attack. Let me mention two that I think are particularly trenchant. Um, first, there is the charge of crony capitalism. More than 70% of the lending portfolio in dollar value are, come from 10 companies. Let's face it, the optics of this are awkward. Uh, many candidates for president have openly opposed the Exim Bank. Candidate Obama in 2008 called Exim Bank crony capitalism, indicating his opposition to the Exim Bank. I'll let the representative from Exim Bank explain the change. Because we want to be globally competitive. I think it's absolutely critical today that we're talking about being globally competitive. How are we preparing ourselves? We hear it not only from an educational perspective, but we need to make sure that our businesses are able to compete and win. And that means trying to level the playing field. And right now we know that our foreign competitors have their export financing arms that are expanding, not contracting. And so I do believe that it's actually imperative for us that we make sure that this gets reauthorized. You heard the story that every time a Boeing plane lands, over 19,000 small businesses land with that plane. That's the kind of story that we need to tell. We need your help up on Capitol Hill. We need your help to tell the stories of the small businesses that Export Import Bank impacts, the jobs that Export Import Bank helps create. And so, if Export Bank, Export Import Bank goes away, who wins? I would argue that the small businesses that rely upon that financing certainly don't win. I would argue that the, the employees, the workers at those businesses certainly don't win. But our competitors abroad, I believe, would win. So I believe this is a bipartisan policy solution. And again, I do believe that we've got to work together. This is a pro-growth pro-jobs policy. And again, I go back to where we started at the beginning. Find me a government program that creates jobs and brings $1.2 billion into our federal treasury. There's not many of them. This is one that actually does those things. This is one that we need to make sure that we are stepping up behind, and we need your help to make sure that you tell this story to members of Congress. I am pleased to say that I know that the United States Senate is working on its own reauthorization. Uh, my hope is, is that that bipartisan piece of legislation will be at least introduced in the next day or two. Uh, that's a huge step forward as well. 
But this is one of those things that as we look at how do we grow our economy, how do we make sure that there are more jobs out there, the Export-Import Bank is part of the solution, it's not part of the problem. And so there is going to be obviously some political finagling going on and people that will argue uh, both sides of this. And I certainly respect those on the other side of the aisle or those that on the other side of this argument. But I do believe ultimately this is about how do we have a long-term reauthorization that businesses can count on that allow us to compete on a level playing field so that United States businesses can grow and win. I thank you so much for being here today. I appreciate the opportunity to come and talk. Of heart, uh, many leading GOP candidates for 2016, including Jeb Bush, have come out against the Exim Bank. It's ironic as Governor Bush ran a company that once used Exim Bank financing. Uh, one possible presidential candidate who is an exception, I think not the only exception, is Lindsey Graham, who recently said, there is no way in hell I will let Exim Bank expire, in typical Lindsey Graham fashion. Um, second is the charge that also I think is vulnerable for the Exim Bank is the issue of transparency. Exim Bank has recently removed data about what loans it accepts and rejects. I think this is a problem and feeds into suspicions about the bank. Exim Bank should fix this. Uh, among supporters, there are two significant changes that are often mentioned um, in terms of changes that they'd like to see, and I think legislation that's in front of the U.S. Congress tries to deal with some of these. Uh, um, the, uh, the first is the issue that, uh, is the percentage of U.S. content. In a world of global supply chains, it is becoming more difficult to piece together manufactured goods that are largely made in the U.S., and therefore XM ought to lower the content percentages to qualify for XM loans. Uh, the response to this critique is that, uh, is that Exim uses content as a proxy for U.S. jobs. Uh, that leads me to the other charge, which I think is at the center of the reauthorization debate on the Hill. Um, and that is the use of Exim credits for coal-related industries. About 18 months ago, the Democratic majority of the Exim Bank voted 3-0 to zero to place regulations that effectively stopped financing for coal-related industries. Uh, the Congress has signaled twice that it would like to end these job-killing rules. Most of the authorization fixes in bills in Congress seek to more permanently uh, fix and push back on this policy. If Anxim Bank's focus is U.S. jobs, then imposing these job-killing regulations on coal does not make any sense. Uh, Democratic Senator Joe Manchin recently said that coal will be a part of Exim Bank's future. So I think as you want, listen to this conversation, you understand that this is one of the elephants in the room. Uh, enough from me. Uh, Congressman Dold, uh, who's with us, we're very fortunate to have him, is a Republican from Illinois and is one of the 60 co-sponsors of a Republican bill to reauthorize Exim. So without any further ado from me, you have his biography in front of you. Uh, please welcome Congressman Dold. Thank you. Well, thank you. I um, certainly appreciate you taking the time to come today and to talk about uh, Exim Bank. And I was delighted to be able to accept the invitation um, from Chairman Hochberg and the XM Bank. And Dan, thank you so much for, for your leadership on this. Um, obviously, there's a lot of interest about XM Bank up on Capitol Hill. Uh, and its charters are set to expire on June 30th. Um, and let me just tell you, from my perspective, we've got a government program here that helps create jobs and brings 1.2 small businesses. That's an important statistic. Some of the critics of the Export Import Bank have still yet to be able to answer me this. If we're interested in trying to create jobs, if we're interested in trying to grow our economy, how does getting rid of the Export Import Bank increase job growth, expand our economy? And if the answer is it doesn't, then we ought to be looking again at how do we make sure that this gets reauthorized. Not that it doesn't get reauthorized with without some reforms, because some reforms, I think, are certainly going to be necessary. Dan told you that there's currently 60 members that are on this, uh, this bill that Stephen Fincher and, uh, is, is the lead sponsor of, and certainly I am with him. Um, but again, we need to try to expand that. Uh, we need to expand it, and that's why it's important. As we look at economic growth, I, I continue to be committed to advancing policies that advance economic growth. In Illinois, there's 244 businesses that rely upon the Export Import Bank. And let me just share a story of someone that came in and sat down in my office just the other day. He came in and he said, he said, Bob, I run a business. It's actually right down the road in Baltimore. And you know what? I'm producing tractors. 
and they're a million dollars a piece. And you know what? The bank, my local community bank, doesn't want to finance that. I need the Export-Import Bank. I need the Export-Import Bank because we're going to ship these tractors overseas. And you know what? If it doesn't get reauthorized, I happen to have a plant over in France. And these jobs that are here in Baltimore are going to France. That's just the reality. And so again, we have a very simple decision to make. Do we choose to step up and reauthorize a mechanism that really only impacts a very small fraction of our exports, 1.6%, but it's a critical 1.6%. It actually provides that financing that oftentimes is a little bit more complicated. And it's not that the private sector necessarily is going to rush in because oftentimes these are transactions that some of these local banks or these mid-sized financial institutions don't want to take, take on that risk. The Export-Import Bank partners, partners very well with a lot of the, the financial institutions out there. And I think you'll hear later on the panel, it's about 98% of the loans that the Export-Import Bank makes is actually partnering up with outside private financial institutions. The fact that the United States stands behind the Export-Import Bank is critical. You hear about not wanting to unilaterally disarm ourselves. 